All right, Lead Well is our series, 2 Samuel chapter 9. We are looking at the gospel today, but in a very unique and interesting way, which will make sense as we go through it. But essentially, I want to remind you that the good news of Jesus Christ is a promise. All God's promises to us are yes and amen through Christ, is how the Bible puts it. God is a God who keeps his promises to us, and his promise is through Jesus Christ, that he's brought us into his family, that we belong to him. We were not, and now we are. He's taken us from being outside his family to inside of his family. That means then that you as, if if I just called you just, you're a Christian, or you said, I'm a Christian, something like that. I prefer to use more biblical language and say, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, one who is a disciple following Jesus, one of the key elements of your character and mine is to keep our promises because that reflects God who is the one who keeps his promises we're like God when we keep our promises so it's really important what we say and what we do and how we do that in your leadership your leadership will have to have the character of saying what you mean and then doing what you say consistently consistently none of us will be perfect in that but keeping your promises in leadership is critical. So that's what we're looking at today. We're going to meet a young man named Mephibosheth. So I just want you to turn to the person next to you and just say Mephibosheth to the person next to you. Thank you very much. And now you know why I'm going to call him Meph instead of Mephibosheth every time I preach. Because Meph like Jeff, right? It's just that easy. And it works. Where have we been so far in our series? Let me bring you up to speed real quick. Like, um, so far in our series, we've, we've listened to and listened for God's voice. Pray for those that we lead. Practice confession. Prioritize obedience. Honor God from our heart, right? David was a man after God's own heart. Trust Jesus, our champion. When David defeats Goliath, we're not David in that. We're the fearful ones on the sidelines. Um, Wait on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord is so critical because we're waiting for him to move our circumstances in our leadership. We're showing people that we trust in the Lord when we wait on the Lord. So that's where we've been so far. A number of great lessons for our leadership. Remember this. Great leadership reflects who God is because God designed the world. He's the one who made great leadership. So when you... Uh, conform your leadership style, no matter where it is, to God's style of faithfulness and keeping your word and doing what you say, all of that translates even to the world's forms of leadership. So be a godly leader, even if you're not in a leadership situation where you can preach the Bible to your whoever it is that you're leading. But in many cases, you can. So in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, King David now is going to keep his promise to a young man who is hiding, he's fearful, very afraid. He does not want King David to find him because he's the last known living descendant of King Saul, and he happens to be King Saul's son, Jonathan's son. So he's Saul, King Saul's grandson, but he's in hiding because David is the new king. So here's the title of the message, Showing Gospel Kindness. And I want to take it in kind of two different directions. First is realize that what God has done for you and me in his kindness, but then also realize that you and I showing that same kindness to others is a critical part of our leadership. So when we come to 2 Samuel chapter 9, we're about 16 years forward from where we are, where we were last week when David was waiting on the Lord to take the throne. He's 16 years in now to having taken the throne. Samuel has died. Saul has died. Jonathan has died. King David has consolidated the northern and southern kingdoms and brought them together in one kingdom. He has defeated most of the enemies that, are, that have been coming against them. And he's really at a point of reflection. Listen to what First Chronicles says about this time period. It says, so Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He failed to obey the Lord's command and he even consulted a medium, which in our day and age would be like, hey, as a believer in Jesus Christ, don't ever pay any attention to tarot card readers, palm readers, all of that kind of fortune telling, signs of the zodiac, all that kind of stuff. That is demonic, just in case you didn't know. That all comes from spiritual forces that are not of God. So depart as far as you can from those things. Saul went to a medium, 
He didn't go to the Lord. So instead of asking the Lord for guidance, so the Lord killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, son of Jesse. And that's where we are now. The kingdom is David's. And it's time for David. He's reflecting now at this point when his enemies have been defeated. He's a little older, more mature, and he's reflecting back on, hey, I need to keep my promises as a leader. And that's where we pick it up in 2 Samuel 9.1. Let me pray, and then we'll jump in. Father, thank you for this lesson before us. Thank you for your love for us. Lord, we look to be your people as we reflect you to the world. Guide our thoughts, our minds, our actions today in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Samuel 9.1. One day, David asked, Is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? So David really doesn't know if Saul has any descendants that are still alive. He knows Saul died. He knows Jonathan died. He's very well aware of what happened to them but he doesn't know if anyone else has survived at this point so he's sort of taking account of his realm and of his kingdom i want you to notice here though he asked is there anyone to whom i can show kindness it is popular in our day and age to wear shirts and things that say promote kindness and that comes from one segment i think of our culture and our population as christians we're tempted to jump onto that word because it is a very christ-like word um, the problem is it's been hijacked like a lot of other words, like lo love has been hijacked to mean something different. Kindness means something different. All our culture takes these things and redefines them, and then people think that you and I, when we say kindness, are talking about the same exact thing that the other group is talking about. You know what I mean? Where it can get confusing. When the Bible talks about kindness, it's a very particular word that's used here. In Hebrew, um, and I want you to say this word to your neighbor, say chesed to your neighbor. So if we had to talk about Mephibosheth showing chesed or being shown chesed today, it would be a really difficult message to preach from start to finish. So in English, we just bring it over and we call it chesed, H-E-S-E-D, chesed. Um, it, but it's a much more rugged version of kindness than you might be used to. We, when we think of kindness, we think be nice. That's not what kindness is. In the Bible, when we're talking about chesed, we are talking about a faithful, rugged love in action, um, keeps its promise, covenants itself, makes a commitment and sticks with it all the way through to the finish line. We're talking about that kind of kindness when we talk about has said, and I'll, I'll give you a definition here in just a minute, but it's often hard to translate in the Bible and it shows up with a lot of different words. But here's the deal. We're told that David... Um, made a promise out of Hesed to Saul's son Jonathan, who was his best friend, and he made a promise to him. First Samuel 20 tells us how that worked out. Here it is. It says, <clears throat> Jonathan speaking says, May the Lord be with you as he used to be with my father, and may you, David, treat me with the... It's translated here, faithful love. That's the same word that was translated kindness in the last passage. Do you see where we're getting at, the range of meaning? I, I want to show kindness to somebody from Saul's family. Jonathan says, may you show that kindness of the Lord, the faithful love of the Lord, as long as I live. But if I die, treat my family with this hesed, this faithful, loving, kindness um, treat my family with this faithful love even when the Lord destroys all your enemies from the face of the earth. So notice then Jonathan, Jonathan is asking David, treat me with hesed as long as I'm alive and then if I die, treat my descendants with hesed. In other words, David, I realize my father was a different kingdom than yours. And I know what the custom is when a new king takes the throne. He kills off all rivals to the throne. But could you and I do it differently because of our friendship? Would you treat me and would you treat my descendants, not put them to death, but treat them with a faithful, loving kindness of God? And David does. They make a covenant friendship to treat each other like that the rest of their days. And now David is at a point in his life when he says, Lord, you've given me rest from my enemies. What's my role? 
And he says, my role is to reflect your heart to show hesed to your, to your entire realm, but specifically the promise that I made to Jonathan. So look at this. Um, here's a dictionary definition of hesed just to show you. Hesed means unfailing love. Here's the way it's translated. Loyal love, devotion, kindness. It's often based on a prior relationship, but especially based on a covenant relationship. And so hesed is a covenant faithfulness. Um, keeping your promise no matter what. A marriage relationship would be a great example of a covenant. You know that the center of a marriage ceremony is the vows? Like if I had two minutes to get a marriage done, I could do it because I would say, do you promise to love her no matter what? I do. Do you promise to love him no matter what? I do. Okay, by the power given to me, you know, as a gospel minister, I pronounce you husband and wife. Why? Because you just promised to love each other no matter what. That was a covenant promise of faithfulness to the other. And then we could decorate that with all kinds of things like rings and vows and communion and scripture readings and all those kinds of wonderful things. But ultimately, it's a promise before witnesses to be faithful no matter what. It's this kind of quality that we're talking about. That's why it has all of these kinds of words. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 is one of the, it's, it's where great is your faithfulness, that song comes out of. But it's so beautiful because it talks about the Lord's has said, it says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases is one version of it. Another version says, because of the steadfast love of the Lord, we will never be destroyed. And it says, his faithfulness and his mercies are new every morning. And I just love that. That's the kind of quality that Hesed brings. Is a, is a faithful kindness from God that you and I, Lamentation says, every single morning when you wake up and you see the sun rise and you see that orange glow or, or fog or whatever it might be, whatever you see in that morning as the sun goes around, as, as everything turns and the world turns and the sun rises, it's constant that God by nature is a faithful, loving kindness God who is going to keep his promise to the people he created to bring them to himself. It's so faithful that every single day you wake up, you know that God is keeping his promises to you that his mercy and his love are brand new that day as much as they were the day before because it never ends. There's no day that you're ever going to wake up and say, God's turned his back on me. That would be a lie. He hasn't. He is chesed, faithful all the time toward us. King David and Jonathan made a covenant of faithfulness to one another. So he promised said to Jonathan, and instead of the custom of killing all rivals to the throne, he's asking, is there anyone from Saul's family that I can show kindness to? So now we pick it up. Um, verse, I think we're in two. Yep. The king then asked him, so Ziba, he's asking him, is there anyone? Is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show, what does he want to show to them? Has said, I want to show covenant, loyal, faithfulness, if they're still alive to them. Ziba, this kind of random servant guy, replied, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He's crippled in both feet. Where is he, the king asked. In Lodabar, Ziba told him, at the home of Makir, son of Amiel. You don't always know when you read something like that if Makir, son of Amiel, is somebody important or not. But a little bit of study will tell you that he's not. Not big of, in importance. And in fact, Lodabar is across the Jordan, far away from Jerusalem. And you would say, why is Saul's descendant living far away in an obscure man's home across the Jordan when his dad ruled and reigned from Jerusalem is the center of all activity at this point. Like, why is he down there? 
Well, we learn two things right here. Number one, we learn that he's crippled in both of his feet. And actually, 2 Samuel chapter 4 tells us how that happened. And it's a very, very sad story. He was a five-year-old baby child. His dad, Jonathan, and granddad, Saul, were leading the army against the Philistines. And that was the battle in which both of them were killed. He lost a whole lot of his family as a five-year-old. Well, the Philistines were raiding that area because they were winning the battle. And they were, they were driving the Israelites back. So his like nursemaid, like his handmaid um, caretaker, scooped him up and tried to flee. And I don't know if she was on, a, it doesn't tell us if she was on a horse or a camel or what she was doing. But she says she scooped him up. And at five years old, she somehow dropped him while fleeing and, and crushed his feet. And they never were healed. or so, so truly he became crippled from a fall. It was a fall that caused him to become uh, unable to walk. And so it, that happened when he was five years old. So that's the first thing that we're told. The second thing that we're told is that he's in Lod to Bar, which is to the south, across the Jordan, far away from Jerusalem. And so what we learn about that is he's at a random guy's house, but he's actually the, the son. So Jonathan would have been the heir to Saul's throne, and he's the son of Jonathan, so he would have been the next heir to the throne of Saul, which means he's a prince, but he's a prince who's not in the kingdom. He's outside the kingdom. It, somebody once said he's in a low place. He's actually gone to, out into hiding. So you're like, why do I find this young man, grandson of Saul, in a low place across the Jordan, away from Jerusalem, hidden, uh, living in obscurity, crippled and unable in a weakened state, and hiding so much so that David doesn't even know where he is or that he even exists at this point? Well, that'll become important here in just a minute, but let's take it to verse 5. So David sent for him and brought him from Makir's home. Just, could you just, just for a moment, imagine how that happens. So David is the king, consolidated the kingdom, big kingdom, ruling the world at this point. And the king says to his servants, go find Makir's home down in Lodabar and go find Saul's le last living descendant and bring him here to me. Can you imagine the royal the horses come in, the chains, the, the royal stuff all arrives. And they say, where's Makir's house? And they're like, it's that one. <laughs> Bring to us Saul's last living descendant. And the guy somehow, I don't know how he gets to the door, but. And they're like, you're coming with us to Jerusalem. What does he think at this point? This is it, right? This is it. I knew that if David found me. He would kill me. 2 Samuel 4 tells us one more interesting point of information. It says that his uncle, Jonathan's brother Ish, his actually Ishbosheth, to add to the whole thing. Um, you know, Mephibosheth's uncle Ishbosheth, who was, you know, who didn't experience chesed. Um, but his uncle Ish, Two guys thought uh, that they were serving David and they went and found Ish in his home and they, they killed him and murdered him, cut off his head, took it to David and said, here's the head of your enemy, which happened to be Jonathan's brother. You know what David did? He goes, you two, I did not call for this. This was not my call. This was not what I wanted. And you killed a man alone in his home. You be put to death. And David put the two men to death thinking that they were serving him. But Mephibosheth wouldn't have known about that. All he knew was, my uncle got found by David, and look what happened to him. He doesn't know what actually transpired in all of that. So at this point, I just wanted you to point out when it says, so David sent for him and brought him from Makir's home. Not a happy time for, for Meph. He's not happy. His name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. Meshib, me, Meph replied, I am your servant. So let's, let's just start and see if I can redeem this whole thing. It could be judgment day for me. So 
what, what I think is so wonderful in the midst of this is you and I know the backstory, which is David's intention is to show the faithful, loving kindness that God showed to him, that he knows God to be, that he and Jonathan, in their friendship, covenanted with one another. And that's what David has in his heart. But Meph doesn't know that. All he knows is the custom. I'm supposed to be killed before a, a king who finds me. And so that's, that's the tension going on in, in the story as we pick it up at verse 7. David, of course, then says what often angels say when they show up. He says, don't be afraid, David said. I intend to, interesting, show said to you, kindness to you, because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. Isn't that interesting? So this one is going, Meph is going to receive said faithfulness, but not because of himself, but because of another. It's David and Jonathan's covenant with one another that this young one is going to receive the blessing of. So he says to your father, Jonathan, I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed. So notice exclaimed, didn't just say, he exclaimed, who is your servant that you should show such loving, kind, faithful, promise-keeping commitment that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me. I'm no threat to you whatsoever. I'm like a dog on the side of the road. Why in the world have you found me to pour out this kind of faithfulness? What kind is he talking about? Well, notice when I said kindness is much more rugged than we're used to thinking. Number one, he says, I'm going to give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, father Saul. Who was Saul? King of Israel. What kind of property would that have been? It doesn't describe like the boundaries of it, but later we find out that it's in Jerusalem. So it's land in and around Jerusalem that would have been prime land because it once belonged to the king of Israel for sure. Number two, he tells him, you're going to eat and you will eat here with me at the king's table, which means that his property was close enough to the city of David, which was right there in Jerusalem. And it means that he was now invited to eat at the king's table, which is where the king's sons ate. So to eat at the king's table was a euphemism and a reality. You, you ate at the king's table, but it also meant you're now treated as one of the king's sons. So you've gone from near-death rival, prince, to eating at the king's table. And you were afraid, Meph, that you were going to be completely obliterated. And yet now you're completely, not only exonerated, you're exalted. You know, you know the, old, the old saying, started at the bottom, now we're here. You know, he's like looking at everything. How did this happen, man? I was, I was hiding in low places. I was so fearful and afraid. I thought if the king found me, I was finished. But here I am, my grandfather's property restored to me. And actually, the verses right after this say that um, Ziba, the guy he asked originally, had a big family of descendants. And he said, Ziba and his family are going to work the land for you. And they're going to take care of it as your servants. So you're going to be the master of King Saul's property. And Ziba and all his family are going to work for you as servants. And you're going to eat at the king's table. Can you believe how Mephibosheth must have, must have felt? He must have just felt like, I can't believe this is happening to me. The kindness of King David has changed everything in my life about how I see myself, about how I was living. I was living fearfully afraid in obscurity with no community. Now I'm in the center of worship in Jerusalem. I've got land I've got servants that are farming the land and taking care of me and the property. I'm one of the king's sons. I'm treated as a royal child in the king's house. Why? And, and David says, because of a covenant, a promise that was made between your father and I, you are being blessed. And Meph's like, I'm not going to ask any questions. Well, I do have one question, actually. He does have one question. Who is your servant that you should show such 
loving, kind, faithful, committed loyalty to a dead dog like me. I think it's so good to just for us to pause right there. And we could go on, you can read the rest of the chapter because it has good things to tell you. But right there, let's just pause and just say, what is at the heart of his question? He is amazed. He is shocked and astounded at this point that he is receiving such blessing upon blessing upon blessing that he never expected he would have received from King David. He's shocked and amazed by that. And he's like, he's kind of asking, what in the world is going on here that I'm receiving this? I should not be receiving this. What I actually deserve, according to custom, is to be killed, to be eliminated as a rival to the king's throne. And instead, the king's not treating me like a rebel or a rival. The king is treating me like his own child. I think that's so good for us to just pause there and consider what it means that you and I have been saved. You and I have been saved. We have been brought to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And because of the goodness and righteousness of Jesus Christ, there's a covenant promise in the gospel that has brought us into right relationship. So I think we're safe to say this. Like Mephibosheth, we were damaged from a fall. It happened in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, and it was rebellion. The fall was rebellion. We were hiding from the true king because they put on fig leaves and the Lord said, where are you? When he came to find them in the garden. So we tend to hide ourselves in self-righteousness. Uh, we know we're guilty of sin. Uh, poor in spirit, we were weak, fearful, and living apart from the community and the riches of the kingdom when we were outside of Christ. We were very much like Mephibosheth. The Bible says we were dead in sins and trespasses. We were guilty of our sins. The guilt of our sin, the wages of sin is death, that we would die separated from God forever, and that we were fearful that if God found us, he would judge us in that moment immediately. If I ever come face to face with God, he is going to uh, put me to shame. There's certain shame for me as a sinner, a rebel sinner, when I meet God. That's what we thought was going on. And you know this in the Bible, but God. This is the common phrase that goes throughout the entire Bible. It's all over the place. One of, one of the great ones is Romans uh, chapter 2, and it says, but God, who is rich in mercy. There's but gods all over your Bible that are so wonderful, because usually right before it, it paints the, the reality of who we are outside of Christ. And it says, but the Savior is God himself. But that's not who God is. God doesn't put us to shame. God doesn't um, send us away forever when we meet him in reality. He actually draws us to himself. So uh, the Bible says it's God's kindness. That's an interesting word. It's God's kindness that leads to repentance. You know that doesn't mean only that God's nice. That's not what that means. It means that God, by nature, is a faithful, covenant-keeping, promise-keeping God who, when he says he loves the world, he loves the world. And so it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. So like David, we could say this. King Jesus came to find us in hiding, called us to his throne, overcame all of our fears, and showed us such faithful, loving kindness that we now eat at the king's table forever. Jesus was talking to his disciples at the end of the book of Luke, end of his life, right near the end of all things in Luke chapter 22. And in verse 20, uh, 22, 28, he says, because you've stayed with me through my trials, he says, just as my father has granted me a kingdom, I, he says to his disciples, listen to this, just as, just as my father has granted to me a kingdom, he says, I now grant you the right to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. Isn't that amazing? That Jesus turns to the disciples and, and he 
culminates at the end, the promise of what it means to know him by faith is to actually come into his kingdom and sit at his table and eat with him forever. It really is true that your story went from fearful hiding to being brought into the king's kingdom and sitting at the king's table and being treated like the king's child forever. You know, you're on really good ground to say, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? That the king would treat me with this kind of loving, faithful kindness to take me from the lowest place of sin and death and darkness and to bring me to your very table and to bless me all the days of my life. I don't deserve it. This isn't me. I'm not standing before you in self-righteousness and saying, look how good I've done. That's not me. Why? And the Lord says, it's on behalf of another to whom a covenant exists. His name is Jesus Christ. And he's 100% righteous, 100% faithful, 100% good, 100% love, 100% full of grace and truth. And because my promises to the world are through Jesus Christ, all who come into right relationship with me come through the benefit of the promise that he is. Listen how John the apostle said it. I'll put it up here for you. John 1, 10 through 14. He came into the world, the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him, all who accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. I just want you to notice that, John 1, 12. Believe, receive, become. Three simple words that explain what happened to you in your life when you received the promise of God to you. You believed, you accepted, you received, and God gave you the right. The right to become a child of God. And in Luke, he said, the right to sit at my table and eat in my kingdom. To become a child who sits at the king's table forever. The right to become the children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan. It's, it's a spiritual rebirth. Now, we would say, how? How did all of this happen? And look what it says. So the word became human and made his home among us. Interesting word right there. When it says the word became human, Jesus left the glories of heaven. He came into the world. He took on human flesh temporarily for about 33 years he tabernacled among us the tabernacle was the worship center that moved through the wilderness with the children of israel and john uses the word tabernacled among us that's what it means made his home is to tabernacle temporarily took up dwelling in the world that he created that rejected him he came into the world and he tabernacled among us and he was full. What do you think he was full of in his life? What did John get to see? What did the disciples experience when they spent time with Jesus? Well, it says, the word became human, made his home, and he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. You know what you hear in there, right? It's called chesed. It is the committed, covenant, promise-keeping love of God in the person of Jesus Christ who came into this world that all who believe him, receive him, will become the children of God and eat at the king's table forever. Who are we? Well, we have seen his glory, John says. It's the glory of the Father's one and only Son. We are Mephibosheth. We are those that have been brought from the outside low places to the very king's table in the highest places. And 
I think you and I are like King David in so many important ways. Let me close with Psalm 89, 14 and 15. It says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Unfailing love and truth walk before you as attendants. Happy are those who hear the joyful call to worship, for they will walk in the light of your presence, O Lord. Isn't that good? Look at those words. What, what, what would you want to commit to in your leadership? These would be beautiful words in your area of leadership, no matter what it is. Righteousness, justice, unfailing love, and truth. Man, wouldn't it be beautiful if you and I committed ourselves to those words and to those concepts and finding those hidden ones, those fearful ones, those ones who are just like us, and we told them about the God who loves them and has kept his promise toward them in the person of Jesus Christ. That is incredibly strong, good, and godly leadership. Let's do that. Let's pray. As we pray right now, uh, I'm aware of the fact that some of you may not have given your life to Jesus Christ. I'd love to lead you in that prayer first and foremost. And if that is you, if you've been hiding from God, staying away from God, you've been concerned that meeting God would be the day of your shame, guilt, and judgment, I have good news for you. Through Jesus Christ, God has borne your shame. He has paid your debt. He has been... Uh, the wrath of God was poured out on him so that it would never be poured out on you and all who believe in him to the ones who receive him they become the children of God and they are the people who cry out to God who is your servant that you're treating me with such faithfulness and God says through my son the Lord Jesus Christ I forgive you of your sins because he paid for them with his own blood on the cross. And I fill you with my Holy Spirit that you would be reborn into a new birth. And I invite you to my table forever that you would be my child and live in my kingdom forever because I love you. God, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance, to turn away from sin, to turn away from darkness, to turn away from the evil one, and instead to turn to you. If that's you today, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith right now. Say yes to Jesus. Put your trust and your faith in him. Turn away from sin. Turn away from darkness. Turn away from rebellion. Turn away from hiding. Let him find you. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us of unrighteousness. For those, Lord, that are turning to you fresh and new, I pray that you would fill them right now with your Holy Spirit. Fill them, Lord, with your presence and your power. Astound them, I pray, Lord, with the transition from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your own dear Son. And bring them, Lord, to your very heart, to your very table forever. For those of us, Lord, that are there, we give you thanks and praise, and we recognize what you have done for us, that we were fearful and afraid, far away, we were weak and unable, we didn't know you, we didn't know how you would treat us, but you came to us and you assured and reassured us that by faith in you, we were coming into right relationship forever. And so because of that, Lord, we come to your throne of grace, and we lay our lives down to you. We live for you. We give ourselves to you. Have your way in us, Lord. Have your way through us. Glorify the name of the Father through the name of the Son in the power of the Holy Spirit. We are your people, Lord, for your purposes. So we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We worship you. We give our lives to you fresh and new today, Lord. We belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, would you stand with us as we sing and respond?